We've been talking about relationships the last Sundays, and we will continue our series for several Sundays about relationships. So much of our happiness in life, so much of our joy comes through relationships. And the Bible has a lot to say about relationships. And uh, also, on the flip side, also a lot of our uh, uh, pain and uh, struggles come from relationships. And so today I want to talk to you about how to be at peace in our relationships, building relationships that go beyond. Beyond is our key word for the year. And we want to go beyond battles to peace in relationships. It's not always easy, is it, in relationships to have peace? I mean, conflicts tend to come. And uh, we're talking about all kinds of relationships. Relationships with your friend, relationships with your co-worker, of course, marriage relationships, and I'll focus on that a little bit today because that's such a close relationship, and the devil seems to fight it because God's plan, this side of heaven, is one man, one woman. That's, his, that's the happiest life we can ever know uh, as far as really God's plan, and 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 and. God wants us to be happy in that relationship, but the devil doesn't. He's in the divide and destroy. And so he likes to do that, destroy if he can. Maybe you're at a situation right now where you're saying, really, I'm struggling to have peace with somebody. The Bible says, if possible, live at peace with all men. And to me, that implies that maybe in some cases it's not always possible. But we're to do our best. If you didn't get the outline, you can hold up your hand, and our ushers will hand you one. There was one in the bulletin, but in case you didn't get it, I want you to be able to follow along. I have somebody that I'm not at peace with and that uh, I'm battling with, and it's really a difficult thing in my life. And I thought I would tell you about my fight. Everybody likes to hear about a fight, don't they? Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, 27 years ago, we moved out into the country and in an old farmhouse that's about 100 years old. And, uh, and if you've read my book, you know the, the miracle of the story and how it happened. It was just an incredible miracle. And when we moved there, uh, as you know also from the book, that uh, we ended up with a horse. And, and um, my kids, we have just five acres there, the house was the original farmhouse for many, many acres, much land. But we just have five acres in the house, and that was what was sold to us. And the, the previous owner, the, the, the people that used to run the dairy, it used to be a dairy, and uh, he uh, owned all the land around us, around our five acres. And he was a real nice guy. It didn't seem to bother him. Our kids would ride the horse over on his land. I mean, I, I, I remember doing it. We ride the horse way over in the center of the section, pick some plum thickets and things like that, and and uh, he he never cared that we rode the horse on his property. Well, he sold the land to uh, a, a farmer that lives in, right in our area, and so all the land right around my five acres was sold to a farmer. And my kids rode the horse off our property and onto that property. And uh, one night I got a call. I mean, late. After 10 o'clock, my phone rings, and this guy just started in on me. I mean, yelling at me over the phone about my kids riding a horse on his land. And I didn't take it well. And I said, what are you calling me at this hour of the night for? And and yelling at me on the phone. And uh, don't worry, my kids will never set foot on your property again. And I... I didn't respond real well, you know. And I knew when I hung up, ooh, you didn't do well, Carl. That was not good. You know when you screw up, right? I mean, and I knew, I knew, I mean, he was way out of line, but I I didn't respond right. And and I knew it. And so, you know, uh, I guess I just tried to go on and forget about it. Well, one day I saw him over there on his land working, and I, I knew I needed to take care of it. So I marched myself over there, and I stuck out my hand and waited a 
few seconds, and he kind of reluctantly put out his. We shook hands, and I said, I'm sorry. I didn't respond well, and my kids should have never been on your property, and I was in the wrong, and I apologize, and I want you to know that we will respect your land, and I will do everything I can to be a good neighbor. And I didn't tell him, you shouldn't have yelled at me, and you could have called at a reasonable hour, and oh, I didn't go there, you know. And I just tried to handle it right. And I, I really thought, well, we can be buddies. I can be friends with this guy. I was wrong. He just kind of grunted and said, okay. And that was it. And that was 27 years ago. And the man to this day cannot stand me. Good old me. Can you imagine that? I just can't imagine that, can you? He does not like me, and I could give you several illustrations as to why I know, but when I'm out running in our area out there, he'll go by me, and I'm, I, I'm sure he guns just, I mean, he goes by 60 miles an hour, and I mean, just like two feet from me, boom, you know, and uh Many a time when he's coming my way and I see him, I wave to him, never waves. You know, my heart just goes out to him. I said, that's got to be one of the most miserable people on the face of the earth. You know, and, and, and I mean, I've, I've given him even some fun waves, you know, <laughs> because he won't wave, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, and I do run by his house, and I pray for him all the time. I pray for him. I say, Lord, take that man and make him my friend. And I can't do it. I don't know what to do about it. Well, anyway, uh, my well is a quarter mile away because out where we live, there's salt water and you can't get. And so my well is a quarter mile away, and it's not on my property. It's on somebody else's property. And luckily, it's not on this man's property it's on somebody else's property, and the man where it is, where my well is, is a very nice man. He's my friend. Of course, I got an easement, so, you know. But anyway, uh, but my line runs under this guy's land and to my land, to my house. I've had several leaks, but they've been down there on my friend's property, and not a problem. We just dig it up, fix it, and, you know, over the years. In the line, there's been leaks. But several years ago, my water started getting, water pressure was, you know, going down. And I said, uh-oh, I got a leak somewhere. So I went down and walked the line on my friend's property. And bad news, no leak there. I said, uh-oh. It's in my, my good, good friend's property. I knew I didn't even dare set foot on his property. But... He had corn. Every other year, one year's corn, next year's soybean. And so this year was corn. So the corn was up. So I sneaked in. <laughs> I'm going through the corn rows, and I found it. Here's this pool of water right where my line would be. And I said, there it is. And I said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do because I can't get in here with a backhoe and dig this up and destroy his crops. I mean, uh, you know, I, I do have an easement, but uh, I have to work with the man. And and uh, and so Gail and I talked about it. The only thing to do is wait till he gets his crops out. Well, we were a month out at least, and our water pressure was going down, down. And I just want you to know, a shower is a runner's reward. It is a runner's reward, and I really learned it. I mean, in a cold winter, I'll just stand in a shower and have hot water on the back of your neck. Oh, it feels. Or in the hot summer, you know, same thing, cold water. Oh, it feels so good. And just cool you off, you know. And, and, and a shower is a runner's reward. I mean, and many a time in the last miles, I'm thinking, I'm headed for a shower here. I'm not, you know. It's, it's, and, and, but my shower got down to a trickle. I mean, it was so bad that you just, you know, and I was desperate. And I had to take a bath after a run. I hate that. And, and it, took, it took two hours to fill the tub. 
you know. And so my wife and I, we were leaving that summer on a, on a little vacation. And so I said, okay, we'll turn the water off at the well. So we shut it off so it's not leaking in his field because there was a pool of water. And so we left. And when we came back, that uh, we went up to see our kids and came back. And, and we thought, oh, maybe he'll have the crop out. And I'll have to talk to him then about getting in there with some equipment. And I came back and the crop is still there. He hadn't taken it out. Of course, other farmers had, but his was still there. And I'm thinking, how long am I going to have to wait? You know, I can't get a shower. I can't. And so we literally didn't even turn the water on. We just had bottled water. And, I mean, we survive them with no water. You know what that's like? It's it's terrible. And uh, I I won't go there. But anyway, there's some some other inconveniences, too. But... Uh, anyway, we got, I, and so I said, well, one afternoon I just slipped in this field again and I go, I'm going through the crops and I got down to where that pool of water was and the, the water had been off for a couple of weeks or so. And so I got there and there was a huge hole in the ground, but it was dried up. It was just a little muddy on the bottom, but no pool of water anymore. And Man, I got on my belly and I got upside down in this hole and I started digging and I found the line and I found the leak. I found the crack in the line and I said, whoa, I can fix this thing. And I'm thinking, Lord, don't let him catch me out here. I will be shot. And so I called Gail and she was out spending my money shopping. And I said, honey, while you're shopping, get this and this and this. And I told her what I needed to fix this thing with. And I went back to the house and I got a hacksaw and I got everything I needed. And I cut that bad part out of the line. I had some more line. And she came and, uh, and uh, brought me what I needed. And it's starting to get dark. It's late in the day. And she had a flashlight. And we're thinking, don't, you know. And I'm on my belly down in this hole, upside down in a hole. You know, it's four feet deep. And uh, I'm fixing this line, and I got it fixed. And, uh, okay, honey, run to the well and turn it on, and I'll watch, you know, with the flashlight and and make sure it doesn't leak. And this went on until dark. I mean, it's dark. And, I, and we got it fixed. We got it fixed. And I said, now we got to fill the hole. Because if he comes through here with some big equipment and drops in that hole, I mean, he ain't going to be a happy camper. And so we got to fill this hole. And so well into the night, I'm bucketing five-gallon buckets of dirt, carrying them through cornfield, getting slapped in the face with leaves from the corn stalks, you know, and dumping them in this hole and filling it up until we got it full and we had water. And praise God, he doesn't know it to this day. that I was ever in his field. But I said all that to say this. He's not my friend. I wish he was. I, I'm trying. I wave at him. I'll do everything I can do. I don't know what else to do. But the man has held a grudge against me for 27 years. Can you imagine that? 27 years ago, my kids rode a horse on his property. And he will, he will not get over it. And, uh, and so, I understand that you just do your best. But let me help you with it. Uh, look at this in verse in Proverbs. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a citadel. Have you ever experienced this? You have, haven't you? There's somebody that you just can't win them back. I mean, somehow you offended them. And they are not going to be your friend again. I mean, they just, uh, they're determined, you know. And that's what Proverbs is saying. Look out, man. And what do you do about it? Well, let me give you some help. First of all, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. There's some 300 names for Jesus in the Bible. He's the Rose of Sharon the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, on and on. 
And here in Isaiah 9, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. If you want peace in your relationships, you really need Jesus. If you want peace in your home, peace in your marriage, peace in your life, you need Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. In fact, in Matthew, Jesus said this. He said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. You want to be blessed in life? Be a peacemaker. In relationships, be a peacemaker. Well, let's look at what peace is not. Peace is not ignoring a problem. Peace is not ignoring a problem. Well, maybe if we just put it, you know, behind us and just ignore it. No, that's not how you solve, a, that's not real peace. Ignoring a problem, no. Unresolved conflict is kind of like termites. You know, you can ignore them if you want to, but it's not a good idea for the foundation of your house. You might want to have it taken care of. And, and secondly, peace is not appeasement. Like one guy said, they asked him, how, do you, how, how have you stayed married so long? And what's the key to success to your marriage? He said two words. Yes, dear. <laughs> There's another guy that agreed with me. See, amen. Uh, yes, dear. But I think we all know that uh, appeasement is not peace. And uh, if we are just a doormat, we, it, 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 it ends up creating some resentment and some anger. And peace at any price is not legitimate peace. And so let me do a cross stick, P-E-A-C-E. Here we go. P stands for plan a peace conference. If you're in conflict with somebody, plan a peace conference. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar, in other words, you came to church and you're about to partake of the Lord's Supper or something, and you're reminded, uh, you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar, go and first be reconciled to your brother. God says, take the initiative. Don't wait for them to come to you. Take the initiative. Go. Go. Be reconciled to your brother. Plan a peace conference. Now, timing is just about everything when it comes to a peace conference. You've got to be very careful. You can't, you can't do it when somebody's tired. You can't do it when they're under a lot of pressure or hurried. You've got to find a good time to talk about uh, problems and uh, be very wise concerning that. And you might be saying, well, Pastor Carl, I already tried this and we ended up fighting <laughs> some more instead of... And you may need a referee. I mean, I've had people make an appointment with me for counseling and they came in and I realized, it didn't take me too long to realize, they, they really didn't want counseling. They just wanted me to referee so they didn't kill each other or something. You know, and they were sitting there going back and forth, and I'd just say, all right, let's keep it kind of civilized here. You know, cut back on the cussing, and uh, let's wa watch out here, you know. Don't, don't scratch each other's eyes out now. Be careful. And I referee for people. And sometimes you just might have to have somebody to help you. But plan a conference. E stands for emphasize. Emp Empathize, empathize with their feelings. Empathize. It, first, it, it just means you just listen. Listening shows you care. Sympathy says, I'm sorry you hurt. Empathy says, I hurt with you. And the Bible says, weep with those who weep. I want to show you a verse in First Peter. He's talking to we fellows, you husbands. In the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, I don't think God meant totally understand your wife, because I never met a man who could. But he means in the way you live with her, understand, is to be an understanding person. As with someone weaker, 
Now, what does that mean? That she's weaker as a person? No, not at all. Uh, most wives are way stronger than we guys. And uh, if you think not, be around when the baby comes and you'll find out. Uh, they have a lot more courage and a lot more. Uh, but like tomorrow's the Boston Marathon and the men will run it in just over two hours. Just a few minutes over two hours. The winning elite run. Could you imagine that? 26 miles, four minutes and something a mile. I can't do one mile like that, let, let alone stack it on 26. I mean, these guys are su superhuman. You know, legs and young, lungs. Uh, and the women will finish in two hours and 20 minutes. 20 minutes later. Now, uh, the first woman across is a winner of the women. And they will honor her just like they do of the man winner. And they should, because they don't compete against each other, really. And physically weaker is what he's talking about. God so made us that way that the man should be physically stronger. Since she is a woman, show her honor. Oh, I love that little phrase. I would love to just list out a few words. I know, I know maybe the phrases are connected differently, but I just love this. She is a woman. Show her honor. You see that? She is a woman. Show her honor. That is God talking there. Do you know every woman should be honored? The woman was made for the man. The woman is a gift from God. And should be honored. She, she is a woman. Show her honor. I'm, I'm out of the old school. I still think we ought to open the door for her. I still think we ought to, you know. Uh, and, and then, I love this last phrase. It's kind of scary, but so that your prayers will not be hindered. Wow. Did you know that God says if you don't honor your woman and women, and your prayers will be hindered? Did you know that? Wow. I don't know about you, but I want my prayers to be heard by God. To me, that's what makes Christian life exciting and is when God moves in our behalf and God answers our prayers and God does things. And we've seen him do things this year that are just miraculous. I mean, we're so excited uh, uh, our staff and the things that God is doing among us. God is hearing our prayer. I, I, boy, I, last thing I want to do is my prayers be hindered. What a verse. Now look at the next verse in verse 8 of First Peter. To sum up, all of you, now he's not just talking to husbands, he's talking to all. All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. And this is how God wants us to be. To be. In our relationships. Also we see it in Philippians 2. He says do not merely look out for your own interest. But also for the interest of others. Care about others. He's saying there. And so first of all plan a conference. Secondly have some empathy. Thirdly attack the problem. Not the person. Attack the problem. Not the person. I had fun this week you know. <laughs> My wife types this for me every week. I mean. Uh, I'm old school. I handwrite it and give it to her, and then she types it, and then I go over it, and then she types it again. And I go, and she's so patient with me. I'll change it numerous times before it gets into the bulletin, gets into your hands. Well, she typed the first copy, the rough copy, and handed it to me. And on this point, it said, "Attack the problem with the person." I laughed about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, as you attack the person. Go ahead and bring in the problem, too, but attack the person for sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm sure that you'd have a hard time reading my writing, too. But uh, not the person. Not the person. Attack the problem. Not the person. Ephesians says, speak the truth in love. I want you to fill in this blank. You'll never be persuasive. When you are abrasive. When you attack me, that puts me on the defense. It doesn't persuade me towards your point. 
You will never get your point across by being cross. It won't happen. Attack the problem, not the person. It is so easy to attack the person. Well, you always, or you never. You're attacking the person. You're attacking the person, not addressing the problem. There is no place for sarcasm, labeling, comparing, commanding. In fact, look at this verse in Proverbs. I love this. The sweet, and sweetness of speech increases persuasiveness. Isn't that something? You want to be persuasive? Look at that. The heart of the wise instructs his mouth and adds persuasiveness to his lips. I'm pausing here because I just want you to think about that for a minute. Speak from your heart. Your heart will tell your mouth what to say if your heart is right. The heart of the wise instructs his mouth and adds persuasiveness to his lips. That's what Proverbs says. Look at this in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives. How? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as Christ does the church. You know what that says? It says that Christ nourishes the church and loves the church, cherishes the church. We are to love and to cherish each other. I may have a problem, but I have to realize I love this person. We, we, we work it out together. So attack the problem, not the person. C stands for cooperate as much as possible. Cooperate as much as possible. James 3. For where jealousy and selfish ambition, ambition exist, there's disorder and, ev- and, and every evil thing. Maybe there's disorder in your life. Maybe there's... It comes from selfishness. It comes from jealousy. Now notice this next line in contrast. But the wisdom from above. You see, you can either be selfish or you can have God's wisdom from above. And if you will humble yourself, you see, we're all selfish. Everybody's selfish. It's not a question, are you selfish? That's our problem in our relationships. When we marry people, we're putting two selfish people together. Whew, potential for major problems. But, so the question is not, are you selfish? We're born selfish. We're naturally selfish. The question is, how selfish are you? And the question is, are you going to let God's Holy Spirit help you to overcome your selfishness? His wisdom from above is pure. Then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Isn't that amazing? Well, the Bible has so much to say about peace. This could be a whole series instead of one Sunday. Peace. The wisdom that is from above. Find common ground. Well, Pastor Carl, we're just incom- incompatible. No, you're selfish. You're selfish. I want you to fill in this blank. More marriages die from inflexibility than from adultery. People just won't move towards one another. People won't give up anything. They won't give any ground. There are five major areas of conflict in marriage. Money, sex, children, in-laws, and schedule. We have to be willing to give some ground Cooperate as much as possible. Plan, empathize, attack, cooperate. One more thing. Emphasize reconciliation, not resolution. Reconciliation. Reconciliation means to reestablish the relationship. Resolution really means to solve the issues, and you can't always solve every issue. You can't always agree on everything. But you can 
be reconciled. Look at Matthew 5 again. Leave your offering before the altar. Go first be reconciled. Reestablish the relationship with your brother. Doesn't mean that you're always going to see eye to eye. I, I know the Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And we do have to agree on the big stuff. But there's a lot of stuff you don't agree on. You know, there's, and we can disagree without being disagreeable. I just figure she has her right to be wrong. We don't, we do, I mean, we don't like the same music. She laughs at my country music, and hers is orchestra or something. You know what I mean? Way high class, high flute and stuff. I mean, we, you know, we don't agree on a lot of stuff. But viva la difference. I love that. If she was just like me, wouldn't life be boring? Yeah, it would be. <laughs> you must have been talking to her. I don't know. Isn't that what makes life exciting? I dare say that's what attracted you, was the difference. You know, this person had strengths you don't have. And you admired those strengths. And you can walk hand in hand, even if you don't see eye to eye. And you must learn that. You're not going to see eye to eye on everything. (laughs) But you've got to get the big picture. You know what? I love this person. And I'm just crazy about this person. And and, uh, that's more important to me than a certain little old issue that we don't see eye to eye on. And so emphasize reconciliation. Not resolution. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5, look at this. Now all things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God reconciled you and me. And He gave you and me the ministry of reconciliation. Building relationships that are strong, that are powerful, that are lasting, that are fun, like we saw last week. Joyous, happy. God is a peacemaker. God is a peacemaker. He is. He's the Prince of Peace, our Lord is. And He called us to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. To be a peacemaker, I must first have peace in my heart. If I am filled with anger, anything can tick me off. The slightest thing. I must have peace in my heart. It's kind of like a toothpaste tube. What's inside comes out when you put the squeeze on. Look at this verse in Colossians. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. That's where it begins. It begins with you and Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Him giving you peace. I'm always amazed over the little things that people scrap over. I mean, I've had people come in my office, sit across my desk, and scrap over the craziest things. And I'm just befuddled. And... And, and, and as they scrapped, I, I, sometimes I sit there and said, just think, this couple stood in an altar one day and committed their lives together and said they loved each other. And now they look at them. I've literally stopped them and I've said, hold it, hold it, hold it. Time out. And I've said, reach over and grab her hand. And they looked at me like I was nuts. I said, no, I, w- I want you to grab her hand and hold it while you talk. I was trying to remind them. <laughs> Oh, how the devil likes to cause conflict and division and destroy our relationships. 
We are in a series about relationships, and I want you to know God wants you to be happy. He does. And joyous in your relationship. And to thoroughly have a relationship that goes beyond. Not just endures, but enjoys each other. Whether it's you and your friend, whether it's you and your coworker, whether it's you and your neighbor, or your spouse. Come to know the Prince of Peace. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we have a Savior who is the Prince of Peace. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I invite you to join me in this prayer. Right where you sit, you can join me. Would you call upon God? He loves you. Jesus paid for your sin debt on the cross. and You can invite him into your life. Come to know him. You can say, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. I agree with your book. I am a sinner. I know Jesus paid for my sins, and I trust him and him alone for my salvation. If you've already done that today, you can just call upon him and ask him for his peace, his power to overcome your natural selfishness, that supernatural peace that only he gives, the peace that passes understanding, peace like a river the Bible speaks of. Talk to God, would you? He loves you today. He loves you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. May everyone here know you, I pray. And God, may our relationships really, really go beyond, way beyond what we could ever imagine or think. How I pray our relationships would just be beyond words, so exciting as we live for you and love you and love each other. In Jesus' name I pray.